have to say the same thing. But I do kind of different things there. I am one of the data people there, and I play with with brain waves and try to figure out what you can say about them and what you can't. And um, that's my that's my game. So today I'm going to talk about methodology. It says generate models, but it's really about methodology. What? Oh, here? Can I just not use this? Like, no, can you hear me? Use the I mic. think you can hear me. Like, I don't think I need this thing. Or like, can there, I, like yeah, should I? Have a oh, okay. Oh, I don't like this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so say no. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so so the, the, the idea of this talk is, is I'm going to talk about something that I don't really know much about. I've been playing with this thing for like a year, and I like it a lot, and I want to tell you about it because I love this shit. So <laughs> I, I want to make sure that more people love this shit as much as I do. So Can we put that on the t-shirt? Of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I also realized something. Uh, uh, that PO has like a, oh, it's not there anymore, but it says something like, uh, we not only do code, what is right. the thing that you it says? You don't just write code. code. We not, yeah, so like just by coincidence, I, I didn't put that much code here. I was planning to put a lot of code, and then I decided, let's go for something more like philosophical. So this is gonna be kind of philosophical in a way. Um, so, so since it's philosophical, then we'll start with probability. So, <laughs> In the usual approach, probability of an event is the frequency of manifestations after a large number of trials. So you have like a like a coin and you toss mm -hmm. it and toss it and toss it and toss mm -hmm. it and toss it again. And then after a while you just count the number of heads. And if you had how if you had done enough trials, then you get a feeling of like how balanced the coin is or whatever. So but of course this is confusing because we have this sense that we can tell the probability of something that only happens once. For instance, we can supposedly tell the probability of like Donald Trump winning the election, and people were saying like 30% and 45% and like 2% and whatever. And so, what does that mean? Like, because it's not like a large number of trials; it's just one. This guy had just one election, and he won. So, what does that mean when we say that somebody has like that's the probability? And so, the question is, does probability make sense in that in that context? And uh, uh, then just a political comment there. <laughs> so, and then and then this is like a, this is a very very old thing. Instead of thinking of probability as a count of frequency, you may think of it as a quantification of uncertainty given a state of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it's like purely philosophical now. Like this is like a guy thinking about like learning mm -hmm. and like philosophy and how, how much you know right now and how much you know like in ten minutes after you read a book knowledge changes how much you can know about the future or like random events. Random events can be completely non-random after a bit, right? Once you, once you toss the coin and you see it, then you are like, oh, it's heads. That's it. So, and then the magic is that this can be fully formalized and is what is called the variation approach. And, uh, and, uh, and it can be fully formalized in such a way that is exactly the same context that you use for the other probability. Exactly the same one. The math is exactly the same when you look it for about time. But then when you read it, you are reading something different. On one hand, you are reading like frequencies of tosses of coins. And on the other one, you are reading like somebody who is looking at a situation and trying to assess how probable a certain situation is in the future. So that happens, just just happens. And that, that the discovery that this was possible was like a big, big political issue in statistics at some point. And it's been a political issue in statistics for a while. And it's like one of those things that you are like, what the hell is going on? Like, these are scientists. Why can't they just like agree upon something? And this is like problematic, even today. So anyway, this totally formalized version of probability comes by default with our operating system. Like in our brain, we feel that we can manage that thing. We are great at it. The bad news is that the implementation is actually quite poor. You believe that you can control probability. You, can, you believe that you can predict how a random event is going to come up. But really, it doesn't work that way. Like people have won Nobel Prizes by proving that this thing is faulty, that this thing is faulty. And it's particularly faulty when it comes to random events, among other things. 
So you can say like, come on, like of course it's not that bad, but it's really, really, really bad. Like for instance, you take six coin tosses, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then one, two, three, four, five, six. And in the first one you get head, 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 head. So um, what is the one? Where is the other one? Tails, 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 tails. Three, three. And then the other one is H T H T T H. And then you ask random people, like which one is more, which one is more likely likely to happen? And people say the second one because the first one is just too structured. So it's not random. It's just it's, it's weird. And, uh, and, and actually, these people proved for the Nobel Prize that the second one, when you restrict yourself to six tosses, the second one is the only one that people in the, on the street actually believe that is random. Any other combination of six tosses, people believe, oh, I can see that. This is really not, not random. But in reality, of course, both have the same probability. And then the surprise is even more that like, you take actually people who know statistics, who teach statistics at school, and ask the same question, and they go the same way. So even when you are trained, you, you fucked it up. <laughs> the, brain, the, brain, the brain is against you. The brain is against you in this thing. We are animals who don't know probability. And then you may ask, like, but we are developers. We are not normal. We are better. <laughs> so who cares? And it's like, and it's like, not only that, but it's like, who cares? And like, we don't care about probability. We work with machines that always work the same way. So like, we, you just make sure that you write the same command, and then the same command just gives you what you want. But of course, we should care about this thing because we rely on data to take decisions. And we collect data and build products on it. And we ingest data and clean it and organize it and even try to predict future outcomes. And then somebody in Twitter, I found yesterday that said, every company is a data company. So this is something that happens to all of us. We all deal with data. And then the problem with data is that data is actually randomness digitalized. So if you want to use data, truly use data, you need to keep in mind its probabilistic nature. Otherwise, you're in trouble. And then what's the risk? The risk is that if you just start playing with data as if, as if you understand it just because you are smart, then you may end up in horrible, dark places. And like that's a beautiful painting that I love of this guy experimenting with a pigeon inside a vacuum tube. And the pigeon dies, and he's like, he's like one of these people who believes that controls probability. And then this little girl, of course, she understands <laughs> that like this guy doesn't know anything about it. <laughs> the poor pigeon died, and there is like in the in the log of the experiment. This is experiment number forty-one, I think. In the log of the experiment, you see the guy explaining how the poor pigeon died, and then like the guy says, like, I'm actually surprised, like. We actually need our lungs, something like that. And it is like 70, some, like 1760 something. It's not like it was the Middle science. Ages. What? It was cutting science back then. Yeah, well, I guess so. Anyways, there is a way to not go that way. You can be just methodic. You can be methodic. If you if you cannot trust your brain, then you need to trust methodologies. So what I'm gonna do during the next few minutes is I'm gonna present to you one methodology of many. And I'm gonna tell you why I'm presenting that. The first one, the first reason is that it is creative. It's not based on following recipes. It encourages thinking, which is always exciting. Second, mathematics and stats and computer science behind it. The, the things that allow this thing to be possible are beautiful. The, the third one is like very close to me is it puts uncertainty and doubt at the center of the game. And since I am a very insecure person, this is like wonderful for me. Because it's like, I can be explicit about how horrible I am as a thinker. <laughs> and then, of course, you can say, it, well, 
And then it, it, it does something that is also really nice, which is that it's not like a, it's not a methodology that you use to solve a single problem. It's a methodology that allows you to look at your data in many, many, many ways at the same time in a controlled fashion. And then finally, it is based on building stories. And I just like stories and fiction. So that's something I like. So the, the approach is more or less the Stern's approach. And I really like this painting of Stern because he has this smile that you can tell that he knew what he was doing when he was writing through some chant. He knew that he was just like teasing you and make you suffer because he took like seven chapters to tell, to make me, to make Tristan Chandy is a book about somebody who is going to tell you his life. And then he spent seven chapters talking about what happened before his day of birth. <laughs> so what, 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 what Stern did, and what I feel that is the, at, the, at the center of this approach, is you make explicit all the sources of uncertainty you may have, and then you come up with a plausible story that explains how data came to be. So let me explain to you that with an example. You have repeated measures of similar events for different individuals. This is something that is super common in any industry. You have like individuals and some times and some locations and some extra info that could be quantitative or not. And then you have a value here. 18 kilograms in this case because I'm talking about dinosaurs and actually did the job of making sure that these numbers are more or less accurate. So, like, therapods were able to eat like one human, and uh, <laughs> sauropods actually need like 500 kilograms per day. Um, so, what we would like to do is we would like to model this thing using the extra information. We would like to, we would like to say something like, um, the food intake is equal to a certain function plus an error. And the function takes the data plus some hidden parameters that are specific to each group, whatever group is in this case, for instance, the type on that table, plus, um, plus a, an error term that is usually like a normal, normal distribution, or no, normally distributed. And then you can make it more explicit. You can say, we are gonna talk about just a linear model. So in a linear model, you have something like the data is here, and then your your orange thing from before becomes these two terms here, and it's a vector, it's a number, and then you have what is called a linear model. And then you can, can be even more explicit. You can say, instead of this thing, you can say, well, my y here is a random variable that is pulled out from a normal distribution that has these linear model and an unknown variance because it's random. So it doesn't have to be always the same thing. It changes a little bit every single time. And then you can say, and my alpha and my beta, well, they, they, they are, they, you can describe them saying like, I, I know that this alpha and this beta are between this value and this value, and I can more or less tell you what is the probability for each of these values according to my current knowledge? So you can say that in addition to the equation. And then, of course, you, take, you need to take into consideration all sources of uncertainty. For instance, if you have in your data weather, the weather is a measurement that is random. Like every time that you measure it, there is a lot of error in measuring weather. So you need to add also relationships in your equations that tell you well, this weather is actually not what you all have really. It's something that is between this and that. So you add all sorts of relationships to this thing, and then you end up with a crazy mess that contains all sorts of equations and mathematical things. Anyway, anyway so you, then you can go in three different possible ways. The happy families way, which is you say all happy families are the same. So. You say all groups are the same, groups don't matter, you just have one equation, you need to estimate alpha and beta for everybody, and that's what usually you do when you do linear regression. You just grab everybody and poof. Yes. Unhappy families. Groups are completely different. So in this one, alpha G and beta G are always different depending on the group. You don't mess with each other, 
and then you do what like machine learning people do these days, which is like you just pawn like a big cluster, and then you run linear regressions for each of the groups separately. And then you can go the Bayesian approach, which is you say alpha and beta g, they are different for, for each group, but these guys come from the same place because these are individuals that are similar. So you can actually inform what you are saying about this group from what you know about this group. And sometimes you have groups for which you have a lot of information and groups for which you have a little information, and then you can transfer information from one group to the other if you set up the proper equations. I'm not gonna get into the details of what's happening there, but that's the idea. Any case, so there are three acts. You have the probability of the parameters, the beta and alpha, which is like your belief about where they are. Second, the relationship between the data and the parameters, which is that equation there, the y equal normal something. And then the posterior, which is the probability of the parameters given the data. You, and then that's the one that you wanna know. Given the prior and the likelihood, we'd like to get the posterior. And then if you apply some basic probability rules, you can, you can actually prove that the probability of the parameters given the data is, some, is something that you can get from the other two. That's what is called sometimes base rule. And it's really not at the center of Bayesian analysis. What is at the center of Bayesian analysis is this idea about not true. In any case, the problem is that this equation is, when you actually write these things in real examples, those integrals are impossible to do, usually, unless you are lucky. You go to math overflow and look for people looking for complicated integrals, and you know that they, that's what they are usually, and they suffer a lot. <laughs> Any case, so how do we deal with that? Well, since we cannot really go for these integrals, then we trust in randomness. So we use something that we learned from the psychopaths of the Man Manhattan Project. This guy is Stanislaw Ulam. He was not as visible as the others, but he was like really into hydrogen bombs. Awesome. And he really wanted them. Like in 1940, he was totally into it, and he was like, Fermi, we just need to, we just need to make this bomb. <laughs> And so they were trying to model like the movement of atoms and then he came up with these ideas that is like, instead of trying to do it deterministically. So this is developed in the last like 10 years by people in Columbia University and in Cambridge. It's a mixture of statisticians and physicists. And uh, let me show you just, oh, this is my code slide. Let me show you how it looks. You want to model something like that? Then you say, well, the data is the observation, the predictors, and the outcomes. You want to model alpha and beta, so you explicitly define what alpha and beta are. And then you say, my model is like this. Y is a normal, normally distributed with these things. And then it's very simple. It's basically writing the math down, essentially. It's writing the math down. And then when you, and then you run a stand on this, and then stand gives you actually a posterior distribution as a set of samples, the flowers. Any case, so now let me tell you what is the methodology, more or less, that you can use when you're playing with these things. You start by having a set of data, then you set up your model, you decide how far you can go in the description of what you are trying to generate. You are trying to generate your data as a random thing. Then you try it with synthetic data. You can recover the parameters that you are trying to grab in the actual data. Once you do that, you run it on the actual data. And of course, the kid who can fly not always manages to do the thing that it needs to do. So you need to check the simulation to make sure that it converges. Then you evaluate the fit of your, of your model because your model allows you to generate new data that looks like the previous one, or it should allow you to do that. So you can actually generate with your model new data, and then once you generate new data, you can say, is it similar to the one that I have in my, in my, in my, in my application? And if it does, and if it's not, and of course this can be fully formalized, then you, you say, well, we have a problem here, we need to go back. And then you iterate or enjoy it. And then you can say, 
you can say, well, but then what is this for? So if your mother, mother survives this process that I just told you about, you can generate, run general inferences on the parameters. So you can say, you can ask any question about your data, and now you are not asking questions about your actual data, you are asking questions to the model that you prove that describes how your data is. You can forecast new observations. So this is like a general machine learning machine. One, one algorithm doing some stupid thing, you have something that describes your whole data, and then you can just try to come up with the with predictions, forecast, this clustering or stuff like that, but it's in your model, and your model understood your data, so you are in a better place. You are in a place where you control everything about your data in a way. So manifestations. So the first one is like a friend, a friend, so I mentioned it there, he, he does, he does uh, micro loans in the developing world. He, he works with people in Zimbabwe, I think. And, and they use Bayesian analysis to, to select, to, to be able to give the proper loans to people. So it's a, it's a great job. Then you have these people from geometric intelligence, like, like told the other way, it's a super secret company that was bought by Uber, not so, not so long ago, and they are not doing deep learning, which is surprising, and it seems that Uber is really, really bad, uh, uh, is going for Bayesian analysis, because supposedly Bayesian analysis would allow you to do what is called small data analysis. You don't have that much data, but you have data from many people, so you can transfer knowledge from one place to the other. Wet lab in Twitter, they actually do neural networks, but what they do is they develop Bayesian methods to design neural networks. So they, they are not really interested on the networks, they are interested in how networks can be improved. Bought by Twitter. Quantopia uses PyMC instead of Stan. Uh, they do competitive algorithm trading plat uh, it's a platform. It's like a competition for people who want to play with, with algorithm trading. Uh, alg yeah, algorithm trading. And so you can go there and you, 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 you have ways of designing your algorithms there. And then you compete with others. And if you succeed, then you can get money out of it. And of course, academic and medical research as a response to the crisis of reproducibility. Because academics had just lost. They, they, lost, they lost the sense of what statistics were, was, and they were just applying um, recipes one after the other. And the consequence of that is right now we know that most of the findings that you find in academic journals are impossible to reproduce. So if you go for a more sensible approach, something that allows you, that keeps you in charge of your analysis, something like this methodology that I'm talking to you right now, that allows you to give better estimates to your uncertainty, you don't say crazy things anymore. You say, you say, I know, but I don't know, and this is what I know. And, and, and I, you are explicit about what you don't know, which is something that scientists sometimes are not quite good at. So what do I recommend you to, to do if you want to learn more about this? This book I love. I, I bought it one year ago, and I read it like every every week or so again, and uh, it is like beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautifully written book. It's like, it feels, it's very, very technical, but at the same time, it's like, it feels like philosophy, and this guy is just, like you read the little chapters, and it's just amazing. Then there is this doing variation that analysis by Kroschke that has beautiful puppies on the, on the, on the cover. So that's the main attraction of the book, but it's actually really good. <laughs> Probabilistic programming and variation methods for hackers is from this person from Shopify. And uh, it's a really, really nice uh, introduction. Then you have this, called, this book called BDA3, which is Variation Data Analysis. And these guys are like the popes of, of, of this thing. So like, this is like the Bible. That's what, what you read once you've gone through the first three. And then, of course, you can go to the STAN manual, but even though it's a technical manual, it happens to be a technical manual where you can learn things. You can also go to blogs and Twitter, because these people are act super active about promoting what they do. Because it's really beautiful. So you have Andrew Gelman, who is the Pope. 
and he has a great, great blog, which is like half political, half like technical. He's really hard. He's sarcastic. He's funny. He's great. You have my friend James Savage, who works at the, who's the data scientist at Blendable, and he is very good at describing how these models are built. And of course, you have tools. Stan is the one that I use. PyMC3 is something that works on Python, so it's a, li a Python library, and you can describe your models inside Python code instead of using that weird language that I showed before. And then there is this new thing called Edward, who that allows you, it's also a Python library, and then you can describe things uh, more or less in way that in PyMC3. So finally, before finishing, I've been thinking about this thing for, 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 for like a year, for no, like, like for two weeks. <laughs> for, I've been thinking about this thing for two weeks and, and I realized that I was coming here and I was like, oh, I should just show this to people and see if somebody can help me. So this is, this is completely unrelated to what I just said before. This is marriages in Toronto. And this is Toronto, this is Toronto, North York, and I don't think it's called Yes. Okay, so, uh, so this is the number of marriage licenses in each of these cities. And I, I normalize it so that they look all the same height, but of course, these guys are shorter than this one. But something, so I was looking at that because I was thinking of using this data as an example for this talk. And then I realized something really, really funny, which is that besides from 2015, any other year has like a plateau on the summer. It's like it kind of flattens a little bit, and then it goes down. And in 2015, in Toronto, it's like a peak. And then you and then you are like, oh, of course, this is randomness, so it could happen. But it happens not only in Toronto, but in Chicago and in Tobico. And then I was like, what is the thing that these people knew that allowed that created <coughs> this weird situation, which you have 2015 with July super high, different from the others. And that's like a question that I just want to give you. Like, what is the information that these people had that collectively created this very peculiar phenomenon on 2015? And uh, I guess that's it. Uh, <laughs> that's what I wanted to talk about. Thank you.